Ready when you are. Yep, ready when you are. Hello. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to a Microbiology Online Journal Club. I'm the, I'm one of the hosts, Fazal Am. My co-host is Danny Chan here. My background is in research integrity and microbiology. I worked on making the fleshing bacteria glow in the dark. And Danny... <laughs> And uh, I did Staph aureus research. I was looking at growing um, a model of skin and putting bacteria on it. And now I fact check pharmaceutical ads. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. And we've got a lot of news. So this we're going to be talk talking about the news about, and we, then we're going to choose what paper we're going to focus and drill down into next week. So yeah, so, so we just spent some time looking at, I guess, what was hot <laughs> or things that crossed our radar on various news sources. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about headlines, I guess, and hope to get something to speak about next week more in depth. Yeah, exactly. And this week, there have been some really interesting headlines for COVID-19. Uh, the papers have been going on and on about dexamethasone. So, mm. yeah, <laughs> dexamethasone. So this is part of the UK's recovery trial. So the in, in the UK, we have this thing called the NHS, which is our big health system. And as part of that, they decided to r run this massive trial testing about seven different arms for different drugs. And from that trial, they, they're testing, from that trial, they're testing uh, like hydroxychloroquinone, they're t testing dexamethasone, they're testing a whole raft of different like drugs to see whether they had any effect against COVID. And just this week, they came up with, came out this really impressive press release that says, says that basically stated that, that for patients who are really high risk, who are already on ventilators, dexamethasone had a, could significantly improve their chances of recovery, which is yeah. big news. It's been hitting all the headlines the only issue so this is like yeah. this is like the it's kind of funny this is a press release so again we're not really seeing the data from it but um it's done by a reputable organization <laughs> and you get to see like the how the media absorbs that right like yeah there people want to <laughs> run with whatever story they see um but like the real argument will sort of be played out when people dive into the results that actually came through right yeah, it's interesting because they've got the the trial documents, or, or, so not the results yet, but the like kind of trial documents of how everything was set out, and then mm. then they've got the this study re design, I guess. Yeah, the study, study design. design, and then they've got this result. So one of the interesting things to look out for when the paper comes out is to see how much the actual re results and the way the what the results and what they present in the paper differs from their original study design, and see whether mm -hmm. that there are any issues with that. Um, but I, I mean, I I feel like it, it shouldn't. Uh, differ that much at all because if you're doing, I guess there could be amendments. They do do amendments yeah. to those types of things, right? Yeah. They do amendments, <laughs> and I mean, I'm honestly, I've got my skeptic skeptics hat on, and I've seen yeah. lots of studies. I mean, there was one study in hydroxychloroquinone that was originally a study for a Chinese uh, herbal supplement. That in the ah, original right. Documents. So. I, um, yeah, but maybe they they change like they have the cohort, but then they're changing up like the endpoints when they come to actually testing things. I yeah. could see that. So I'm always a bit skeptical whenever. I mean, the things to look out for for when press releases come out and for when papers have like really good studies. I mean, there's this happened a lot with uh, art, like, drugs like Tamiflu, where they produce some really good looking studies and the trial mm -hmm. design. But when you looked into the trial design, you find that they ask patients, "Oh, so uh, what?" Well, so you ask, ask the art doctors, how do you, do you check for pneumonia? And they said, oh, we asked patients, but they thought they had pneumonia. And you're like, <laughs> Yeah, okay. patient reported pneumonia. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's that's great. And But it's one of the things that it's important for you to, to know and look at for when you're reading the paper so you can put the, these sorts of things into it, take them into account. Yeah. Um, uh, something else that fascinates me about this sort of thing, like press releases coming from like a large health, public health organization, right, is that, you know, who who's going to pay to do these types of trials like these therapeutics that they're testing they're already approved for different things maybe they're not even under um they're not under patent anymore yeah. right some of them probably have generic forms and so like <laughs> there's no big pharma company that is profit motivated enough to go and do this study it lies on public health groups to to do them i mean yeah that's actually one of the big strengths of this study because dexamethasone is one of those it is a, it has generics it has out of patent so people can buy mm -hmm. them very cheap so and th there are already loads of doses because it, i mean one the th i mean I, I mean uh, i've got a parent who uh, i've got a relative who's asthmatic who was prescribed mm -hmm. dexamethasone and at the beginning of this outbreak when she had these terrible yep. sad symptoms she was prescribed that and 
and among other things. So I guess I'm so, so slightly biased to believe the study, which is immediately why I'm skeptical of my own <laughs> of life. <laughs> sure. I'm immediately sure. skeptical of that because of my, I've, I have a personal anecdotal experience that could be used to say, oh yeah, I believe this is true. So I'm immediately going, ah, because I was fooled last time with the ret with the big retraction in Lancet, so I'm, they're not going to catch sure. me again. <laughs> <laughs> I was fooled by Sergio Sphere. I'm not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's very interesting. And, um, let's see something that I found. Um, um, I just wonder, oh yeah, I, so yeah, oh on. yeah, go ahead. Because no, like, the thing about the dexamethasone is it's kind of the anti like it's it's the opposite of how other drugs would. We're looking at what so it's not like an antiviral it is very much an immune therapeutic um mm -hmm. so it's so the, that that's interesting because i mean if you give it to someone early on in the symptoms you're knocking down the immune system actually making them more susceptible potentially more susceptible to the virus but mm -hmm. so if you put it in the late time then that can help out a lot whereas say if you have a drug like remdesivir which acts directly against the virus that's much more useful at the earliest st stage of infection i think we talked about this before because it yep. hits it before the virus can establish an infection. So, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that I think, uh, you know, to help people, I, I, we're super familiar with the concept, though, of disease being partially driven by the virus, but also the host response to that virus. Yeah, so that speaks to the host, like modifying the host response at the right moment might help some sort of disease outcome. Yeah. So I'm going to be looking at papers that uh, are, somewhat into that but anyway uh yeah is that is that why you want to talk about the talk tocilizumab, tocilizumab. tocilizumab. <laughs> i know <laughs> right because that's all that's also the same thing it's instead of a small molecule uh immune modulator it's a monoclonal antibody immune yeah. modulator right yeah so it targets interleukin-6 which is one of those big like inflammatory cyt cytokines that signals to the immune system to to start fighting the virus and go crazy and to so i mean you've got like these two phases of the virus the viral infection where, where one is like the initial phase where the virus is establishing itself second phase is when the immune system goes crazy and then eventually it all that causes your lungs to fill up with all these immune cells who are rushing to kill the virus but accidentally kill you at the same time so it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so talk to zoom yeah but sorry uh, oh, sorry. I was just saying, and and there's sort of you could modulate the amount of virus that gets appeared, so that means the immune system doesn't respond as much, or you can on the back end <laughs> modulate the immune system. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's basically this kind of operates on that stage of infection, the same way that dex. But since we don't have the dexamethasone results, we can. I was thinking, as a kind of substitute, we could look at this paper on tocilizumab that was published in. Uh, 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 where, where did I put that? Um, uh, yeah, it was published in uh, P PNAS, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Effective Treatment of Severe COVID-19 Papers with Tocilizumab. Uh, so that's one of my pitches for next week. Yeah. Um, what sort of figure? I guess we should probably look at the figures and get a sense of what data we'd be seeing. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Look, look. Oh, I see CT. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've never seen CT before. <laughs> we, we, we have not. So that's an interesting thing because that's looking into the. Because uh, again, you're looking at this late stage of infection. You want to see whether the lungs are okay or not, whether this treatment has an effect on that. Mm. Uh, and you've got like. And it's in, it's in humans. Yep. Oh, this was like a. Yeah. Th I also see we have a lot of studies because it happened in China first, right? Like they're the ones that have. A lot of the data from humans yeah. like humans who actually got infected um i guess slowly the rest of the world is definitely catching up on that yeah i mean the only i mean it's not a big clinical study it had only like 21 patients uh it mm -hmm. it it's not uh, yeah it's a small paper it's a very small paper and it's mm -hmm. very early stages i mean there's some people quite positive about this but then yeah lots of people positive about lots of drugs so i mean we always have to be kind of skeptical but I also think that, I mean, the other thing that we can talk about here is that there's that on-label, off-label yeah. <laughs> distinction, right? Like inside of drug pharmaceutical promotions, but then how doctors end up using things. And I, I'm pretty sure I've heard that doctors have been using this um in the clinic. So, right, like they they were looking at these figures and saying that, oh, we should give this a try and like, you know, like what was going on in their institution and, and going out on a limb. 
So it's kind of interesting to see maybe what those doctors saw in the paper in order to make them make that decision and maybe how that differs from a typical clinical trial like level of evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things that I pop I found this week, um, I, I guess I, I got a lot of the suggestions from This Week in Virology. I thought they had some good ones. Um, there is a hamster model for transmission that okay. was published in Science. Um, pathogenesis and transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in golden hamsters. Oh. Um, and, oh, do you got it? I can send you the, okay. Uh, yeah, so it um, they have a model of transmission. So, you know, we were talking about models last week and how different models for different purposes, right? And how, you know, early in the infection or like the, the macaque model, um, like it doesn't, they don't really die <laughs> 21 days after yeah. they're still alive, right? Right. So, but, but because those first days look like disease and when you cut up the lungs, you see immune infiltrates, then they use it as disease. So this is a model where I don't think they get disease or it's like a very minor disease they get, but they definitely get, they definitely transmit it to each other. Um, and they can do things like, um, I guess, like test if they transmit through a barrier, if yeah. it's like on surfaces, stuff like that. I mean, again, it's like the weird analogs in a hamster cage to yeah, our life running around a city it's kind of interesting where they basically like took some donors sort of cages and they put the donors these like infected animals in the cage they took them out put new animals in them and were like oh do, do they get the virus or not so it's kind yeah. of interesting they i mean they, so it's it's kind of it is interesting to look at these sort, sorts of studies and yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's just an, another model uh, to add to the, the pile of models that yeah. <laughs> science is coming out with to help us deal with uh, this issue. This one would get at, um, like, maybe there are therapeutics that inhibit transmission, right? And then we can try to think about the model in that light, right? Like, what would it be used to test for? Um, yeah, given the what they're reporting. Yeah, oh my gosh, got like things like, does it transmit on plastic, paper, or corn cobs? I'm like, well, maybe this is not like the other. <laughs> yeah, for our corn cob skyscrapers, you know. Like... Man, like, so lots of us want to have barbecues right now, and it's very important. <laughs> this is important information. We need to have. Yeah. <laughs> that specific vector of disease. <laughs> yes, yeah, like, hey, you can have barbecues, but as long as they're corn on the cobs. <laughs> Always on the cob. <laughs> <clears throat> And I think we both found another model paper that yes. uh, we might be discussing. Uh, that was published in Cell. Yeah, uh, that's the uh, oh the human the like uh, um, yeah the, a SARS CoV oh yeah SARS CoV two infection model in mice demonstrates protection by neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which I mean I think yeah this has been quite interesting because they they uh, mutated them they gave the mice the ACE two uh, gene. By like by actually giving them a gene therapy with an adenovirus first. So <laughs> usually for these gene therapy things, you'd actually go to the germline and have them express and spend ages. But this one, they literally like gave them a gene therapy to give them that kind of protein and then give them an infection. Which I, I mean, the first part in itself. And that's and that's ad five, right? Or not ad five, but like that's yeah. adenovirus. Like we talked about adenoviral yeah. vectors last week. It's funny that, and I think we also spoke that we we read that there was this paper came out, right? This yeah. um. This model because we, um, we did talk a bit about the models and how like the mice I mean, hit, like respiratory system is quite different from humans so mm -hmm. uh, what, what what will pneumonia look like and this paper actually goes into that a lot more so they do look at like kind of the the pathology of the lung i mean looking at the slides so these mouse lungs look like they've been through the grinder i mean they're... yeah but this is something that um I, I i presume you were very familiar with in grad school right this type of like lung or like diseases in mice <laughs> reporting a, a disease model in mice this is like the bread and butter of an infectious disease microbiologist yeah it's it's basically i mean half your job is trying to figure out which part of your model is relevant and which isn't and what to report on otherwise like because mm -hmm. mice are, they they only breathe through their nose they uh they can't like they can't sneeze or cough or vomit and there's all <clears> sorts <throat> of things that you have to like almost be like oh this symptom is 
the, where the mouse is like all it's got it's like uh, sometimes they like have uh like what was it lacrimosing like t tears in their eyes to be like that's equivalent to this tears or, yeah like, other sorts of things where you have to get really subtle and and deep into things right uh right yeah, it, actually, I like the figures in this. It looks I like seeing like the standard progression of figures. You know, like sometimes without even diving into the data, you sort of see like what what story is being built just by how the graphs look like as you're scrolling yeah. down. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's quite. I I actually so I said earlier I thought I found the preprint version of this paper. No, I actually found a preprint that is another humanized mouse model. Um. In, and in that one, they adapted the virus to the mouse. No. Uh, <laughs> so, right? Yeah. I... Yes. Uh, mouse adapted. Yeah, sorry, let me just open this up so I can see it. It's called A Mouse Adapted SARS-CoV-2 Model for the Evaluation of COVID-19 Medical uh, Countermeasures. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, and so in this one, they actually give the the SARS uh, virus uh, the the receptor that allows it to <laughs> bind to the mouse ACE2. Yeah. I mean, a recombinant SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> yeah. The opposite. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm kind of concerned about the dual use kind of aspects of this paper that they basically said, oh yeah, we'll, we've we taken the SARS-CoV virus, we've changed the receptor so it can now affect, it feels very bioterrorism -y. it just doesn't feel very yeah it's a little bit edgy right in that yeah, sense it's kind of, <laughs> you're like if you really hated mice you'd, lo you'd love this paper i mean this is just <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i guess if we choose if we if we want to talk about mouse models these would be good like right this is like kind of like a shadow version um yeah. to talk about as well yeah, they're, <clears throat> they're nice counterpoints to each other and they can't it's, it's mm -hmm. very interesting because again we do see this in other diseases where like i know that for um for like E. coli, E. coli doesn't work. For, it doesn't like give the same kind of infection in in mice. So, so my old supervisor used Citrobacter identum, which is which behaves like. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the Citrobacter identum is the Salmonella enterocolitica of like. <laughs> yeah, and like of the mouse. I, I know, like <clears throat> in in my own field of like fleshing disease, for about like twenty years, they were working on this one like version of the fleshing bacterium that really infected mice very well but they realized it mm -hmm. was just only infecting mice it was not relevant to humans so it's, so it's right so it is interesting what well, you can you can pull out certain interesting things from these studies but they're yeah. often i mean like every model no model is perfect but you can pull out some very yeah. good information yeah. from these studies but you have to like yeah. yeah and and i think ta talking about the paper is again like you know so much of trying to communicate like condense down all of what we know about models and good models, which is an ongoing conversation too, right? Like that's a debate that's happening in science oh, constantly. Yeah. Everyone's arguing like you didn't use, you use this model instead of using this model, right? Like you showed it here, but how do you know it applies here? Yeah. Um, yeah. That I think those are great discussions to and have. That's, that's so. why we see so many papers where I have multiple models where they cross confirm things because uh, yeah, because multiple lines of evidence, that's one of the things that is, is key to science. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah um what else do we have <clears throat> uh what else do we have uh oh the mrna we the moderna uh published a preprint of their mouse yes. study so moderna <laughs> i mean i've been hearing a lot about the moderna vaccines by press release uh again they mm -hmm. they seem to be doing quite well but we don't have anything to put our teeth into but i think this is one of the first things we can really like dig into a bit yeah Mm hmm. And I saw in this preprint, what I liked about it was they have, um, and, and just not relevant necessarily for the paper, but the relevant for us in a discussion, they have like a timeline yeah. <laughs> of, of uh, their path to getting to this point, extended data figure two, <laughs> I saw. I thought that was kind of cool, just because, you know, so much as contextualizing things in the timeline is kind of interesting at this moment in history yeah. um, to see like how people use the knowledge that came before and tried to transition it into something that we could use right now <laughs> that we could use yesterday um, yeah. but of course that's not going to happen <clears throat> yeah, I'm just looking at that oh yeah yeah I can see them they're bragging <laughs> yeah. Them bragging yeah yeah, yeah. Of... 
I mean, I'm that that looks like something that would come from their like their marketing web, yeah, like, their web page. It, it yeah, for sure, that looks good for me <laughs> if I was going to invest money in them. Is if they look, look how efficient we can do vaccines. And this is, and I'd be like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I'll invest money in you. So next time a bunch of people start dying, I can make more money. And yeah, so. But I mean, that's that's the weird. You know, that's what I've learned a lot after doing a lot of fact checking right, for um, ads. Is that there's an interesting dialogue between companies and the people who make papers right yeah. and like these companies that uh that are writing their papers like they're hiring clinical agencies yeah. to do the writing sometimes right like they have key individuals that they have relationships to inside of the academy that they are asking for certain types of language that like allow them to say what they need to say on the promotional side um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I see a lot of that in the journal's publishing world, where occasionally I get articles submitted by a random person out of nowhere who just from medical writing company, and I'm, and all the reviews start pushing them with yeah. a bunch of questions, and it gets and often like we'd have to say like no, we can't allow this because we have to talk to the real authors, but it's right. So oh yeah, because yeah. like they serve as the front of it, but like they don't they can't answer the questions with the data. Yeah, they <laughs> they just prepared the manuscript. Yeah, and the thing is, technically they shouldn't be held responsible for the data. They should be like kind of the author should be in contact with them. If the, it feels like like the communication is really broken down when the medical writer goes, "Fuck it, I'll talk, take over the submission of everything," because <laughs> really the, the yeah. author should be going back to them rather than the medical writer. Oh my, well, they're going to go rogue. We need to stop them from. <laughs> right. Well, I think that that's actually that's uh that's a business model yeah. right like those agencies like they're saying like we'll take care of it for you yeah <laughs> right as if reviewing was just a yeah i see this a lot in in that promotional ad space reviewers are just a bar to leap over right like yeah. it's not like a meaningful dialogue is happening there right it's seen as like oh like it, once we get by then it'll be out there yeah, no, <laughs> once we can get by that bar it's like you get <clears throat> anyways actually, often you get very high quality papers but we can't accept them because they're not being submitted but they're being submitted out of the ether so we're like okay well goodbye and I, I really wanted to publish that but i can't it just <laughs> sure so like at, they don't ever come around and actually provide like the contacts for the actual authors like oh, it's they, if the worst ones where they public they pu pu put the names of the authors but they the email addresses are for x and x at medical writing company which is oh, uh, crazy <laughs> author impersonation and we can't allow that it was like you're clearly uh, like i see that's just a that's a flat out no like when you see that or it's well do you we we try to like we, well, often we try to like get in contact with the real authors, see whether this is a real, gotcha. real published paper. Right. How, is this? Are you aware of this? Can you please put your, just like give them the. <laughs> yeah, can you please be the corresponding author can you on this? Please be the or... corresponding author on this. Please, <laughs> <laughs> don't try to deceive us. That makes a very bad first impression. For <laughs> sure, sure. <clears throat> and like, yeah. Um. So it's uh. Yeah, I, and uh, actually, like that's a, that's really interesting from the the from the standpoint of preprints because preprints would never have anyone reaching out to them yeah. on that on that basis right so there could be preprints out there that are that are being headed by medical right agencies but not being called out on it yet right because they haven't gotten yet to the stage where they're trying to submit to a journal i mean i think a lot of like articles are, are like going through medical agencies but it, most of them are smart enough to not make that kind of mistake um <laughs> sure um sure uh, yeah well I, I to me it's like totally new i, I never experienced that uh, from the grad student perspective i never saw medical agencies doing the writing yeah i mean it, it's but that's like a, it's a different world right like they like even within science there's like different ways of getting those papers in yeah and yeah it's it's interesting because there is this entire like other like kind of world science of things like contract research organizations that that can basically try to replicate studies so that investors can figure out what they want to actually invest in so there's mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a whole like kind of shadow side to, to science where people are, who don't quite believe what's going on run their own science and then they but they don't tell anyone they just go like okay well we know yeah. this is working yeah i remember i remember that came out um when the open science research framework the osf mm. right uh they they had the publication of the replicating the psychology studies yeah and then there were follow-up articles saying that 
it's well known in the cancer field that like when you try to replicate things like nothing sticks yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that stuff's never been published because it's all done you know just by people that are trying to push their products forward uh or investors and stuff like that yeah, yeah. i mean if you ever the go to, comes to a conference from. and like can't you often hear people trash talking each other like mad in certain places or like you yeah like uh i mean it's quite and you kind of hear like rumors of that by your supervisor and to their, their connections and there's a whole like social mm -hmm. aspect to to science that people don't really i mean there's all these sorts of parts of the peer review system and it's all very complicated and it's 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 a lot more messy than you'd hope yeah <laughs> yeah 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 well because i think also a lot of information is inside of just conversations yeah. right like just like one-on-one -on -one picking apart papers and so the people, the groups of people that are doing that, um, you, you're more in on that conversation than if you're not picking apart papers on a regular basis. Yeah. And the thing is, you, a lot yeah. of these conversations can only really happen in private because of libel laws, because of like certain, mm. like, so it actually makes it quite hard for people to speak speak out against these because there have been instances where someone says, oh, your research is terrible. And the other person's like, okay, fine, I'm suing pub peer now because you're saying that <laughs> and sure sure so oh yeah. yeah um that's why peer review <laughs> tends to be anonymous and that's why it's quite hard for an open peer reviewer to to not be anonymous because if we because we're out here we're, we've got our right. identities but if we start saying stuff like x and x is terrible then that could leave so we have to be so we're, we tend to be quite, quite a lot more careful about what we say and give people the, mm. the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm <clears throat> So, All right. What else do we have that we found this week? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I mean, we could delve in. I have. Okay, wait. I, I have one more. If yeah. you don't, I have. Um, I also found a GWAS association. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Genome-wide association study of severe COVID-19 with respiratory failure in the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. Okay. Uh, so GWAS. <laughs> uh, I need to. Read a bunch of books on statistics to figure out what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, this is sort of, um, this is like whenever you hear the the latest hot news article saying, right, like so and so group is more likely to have this disease, or, right, it's maybe it came from a GWAS study where they just blasted through a whole bunch of genomes and found a statistically significant result and then. In the discussion, it comes out that like that locus is associated with this, this, and this, and then that gets picked up by the media and amplified. They found a gene for well, the there's finally enough masks, people. So like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's finally enough data, I guess, from people who've been infected, right, and genomes to attempt this type of analysis. Uh, so wait, what's the title of that? Um, it's, uh... it's, 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 it's a genome-wide association study of severe COVID-19. Let me send you that <clears throat> yeah i that i'm not sure again like this is one of those things where like because our backgrounds are infectious disease models this is kind of definitely stepping outside of those things yes. <laughs> right like and and we and we played we've thrown around it a couple times like um should we talk about like uh the observational studies on large cohorts of people looking at disease features right between everybody um i mean you always have to step out a little bit when you're trying to read the literature like you're never going to be able to do something where you're the expert in and we're by no means experts anyways in <laughs> infectious disease models just that we're more comfortable there <laughs> yeah i mean we, we, we both have some experience with infectious disease models i mean i know i had quite a lot of experience with that during my phd the only question yeah. is like if if my suddenly got out of fashion and we work into AI, then I'm going to be lost. But I mean, <laughs> the in silico models. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is this is sort of that, right? Because um, there are many ways to parse out the data of a GWAS, and sort of that's the whole point yeah. of reading these papers is saying that like, did they do those statistics properly, um, or or how are they choosing to represent? Right, all those different loci and patients. In some ways, it also reads a lot like a clinical study paper, right? Where it's like, well, what was yeah. the population that they worked with, right? What were the limitations in sampling that they experienced yeah. the data set? So, I mean, it's it's interesting. Yeah, they do lots of. Uh, I mean, yeah, because the thing about G, uh, on the surface, it doesn't seem like there's there's much there, but it, it's all about the delving into the statistics and figuring out how they. Because I mean, 
the supplementary material is going to be massive on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because I mean, a lot of it. I mean, this is a a clinical study, so there's going to be lots of ethical things to deal with. There's going to be a lot of uh, a background, like looking into like kind of the baselines for for things, and it is an observational study as well. So it's a take. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm yeah. Getting... There's no, there's no intervention. The, the controls are a lot different when you're doing these observational things. Yeah. They actually, are, they're, they're much more important, and the limitations are much more pronounced. And you don't control them, right? Like yeah. you have to observe them. Yeah. I mean, this is like a hypothesis-free research, research almost. I mean, it's not really, but it's, but it, like it generates like those, those sorts of hypotheses that can be looked at in the future. Um, right. Right. If they do see a very strong association, maybe we need a new model to to yeah. test that association. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. I mean, it, 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 Gino and I, so they're they're really good. It's just they're very complicated, and it's quite. <laughs> and yeah, delving into them, it. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot to 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 go through, and and just looking at the author affiliations is like massive amounts of people who are involved. Oh my god! Yeah, it's like the it's the longest author list ever. And like, and again, like a lot of the the things we talk talking about with COVID, a lot of them are talking about the kind of age and and kind of vulnerabilities to to the disease. And there is always that concern that like genome wide might not. There's all these other factors that might potentially have a much bigger effect on it that we need that. that right. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, that's right. You you only know what you're looking like. You can only yeah that. Not everything can be covered in one of those studies, right? There's covariates. If the covariates are unknown, yeah. And the thing that always, I always try to look out for is, is this study racist? It's not just check mm. always something yeah. to check out for. I mean, for some, sure. most of the time it's, but it's something to like just be aware of because there is a history of 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 that in in the, these this, this, this sort of field. So trying to like make sure that. That that's been accounted for just in case uh, sure i uh, i mean in the writing that's definitely a big part of it but then also there's the natural thing where there's tons of limitations when your population size is like when your population is chosen from a select group of people yeah right like there's all this stuff that people get criticized that we only know things about mice but like even on the genetic side sometimes we only know things about a certain type of person right like yeah, uh, that would participate um, in a clinical trial. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> is your population uh, W E I R D, which is I think it's pronounced oh, weird, yeah. but like uh, it's like is your pop population white educated in like yep. in higher education or something? It's yeah, uh, for sure. So that was I remember that term being levied against uh, those psych studies because you know you could get ten dollars to participate in a psych study on campus. Yeah. And that was a that was a lot that was a large incentive, um, still is a large incentive, right, to getting research subjects in that area. Yeah, we know a lot about the psychology of college students. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's actually all I, I well, actually last week I didn't get to talk about two things, two papers I threw up. Mm -hmm. um, one was one was all is an epidemiology assessing the differential of. Differential impacts of COVID nineteen on Black communities. Oh, now that's an inter yeah, that's an interesting one. That's a big story. That that I mean, it's yeah, that's uh... yeah. I was I was saying earlier that like I was trying to find data about like uh, access to drugs. Like if I could find like more uh, accurate, I guess, assessments of like what's what's running out where. Uh, but I guess like that's the trick in, in the U S. That's a huge challenge of the decentralized nature of healthcare, um, that data is just not available really. Oh, God. I, mean, um, I think they've got that data available in in the UK, but it just gets released on like a quarterly basis. I think maybe. Right, it's, it's slow to come out, and yeah. <clears throat> because essentially, you are relying on lots of people doing cooperate. Well, submitting their data at the same time. Um, right. So yeah. So yeah. So this is a epidemiology paper. It seems like they have. It's again a, a lot of looking at statistics. I think we'll be thinking about how they've chosen their populations for study, um, how they're choosing to look at different covariates, yeah. forest plots, and mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it, I can definitely see like uh, hold on. yeah. There's there's some very interesting. Yeah, this one looks like it could be. Wow, yeah, no, this 
this looks like it could be quite an interesting study. Yeah, thing. Th this this came off of the John Hopkins. Remember I said last week, I was like diving into that John Hopkins website where they have little short blurbs about things. I found that through there. Um, and again, like we, it's like, yeah, there's definitely a social element and I think it gets lost sometimes to to be able to discuss it. And and, then, and because I think that um, it's just not, people are looking for the solution, right? And then here it's like, oh, they're identifying an issue. And I think that can be very difficult, right? In the publishing world to, to have like a lot of hype around. Yeah. And it's, it's also like, it is broaching into sociology, Rob. So it's kind of an... In I mean, exactly so yeah it's it's kind of interesting and and just yeah I, I mean, I'll right yeah because it's not because the yeah because the covariates that they're looking at they're not their metrics of health that are being collected by public organizations or hospitals and stuff like that yeah it's not the same type of data collection that we're used to as well even from the clinical side i think it again it bridges it's it's leading on that clinical side, right, where we're thinking about enrolling patients and stuff, right, and kind of like even broadening that out more because now people may be giving questionnaires and stuff like this or inferred from like numbers that we see. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, because uh, I think like this one I would look like to. I mean, I could ask around to see whether I can recruit someone to uh, to help us go through this maybe. Or I mean, if that yeah, be that'd be really cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, somebody who's more like attuned to this these kinds of issues perhaps uh and also like these this kind of data because yeah yeah the the data does look very i just opened it and like the data does look very different to me than what i'd be used to talking about um yeah. but yeah and, but it was up it was up there in the <laughs> it was up there on yeah, the, I think one it's of the a, database it's like a really like timely paper to to look at but i just want to make sure i like get it as right as possible so for sure yeah for sure um, and then I also found something on there again. I guess these are all the computer ones, which is why I didn't bring them up last time because it's like <laughs> I'm not sure how comfortable we are with these. This one's uh, phylogenetic network analysis of SARS CoV 2 genomes. And so this is just a this is a tree. <laughs> like, are is all the SARS related? <laughs> okay. Or what is the relation? Yeah, uh... and and where they 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 are out in the world. Oh, it's only a single figure. Now that I popped it open, it's very small. It's, it's very I don't small. Know. So, I mean, I remember like these. Yeah, these are like classic like under. I mean, like doing some statistics to build up trees to like look at where the yeah the it's, timeline of the it's phyl it's phy it's phylogeny yeah. right phylogeny and they they overlaid some geography over the <laughs> over the network. Yeah, I mean that. I mean it, yeah, it is like yeah. There's not really much to dig into here apart from maybe like looking in i mean yeah this is yeah this is it this is a very short report i didn't realize how short it was <laughs> until i popped it open just now <laughs> yeah because like when you see like network analysis you you, you seem that they're going to have like quite a lot of discussion on the network rather than just put up the network and be like okay <laughs> analyze yeah this. It, and sometimes you don't know sometimes they follow up afterwards right and they with with some with some other data right maybe then they took that network and they did real sampling and then the sampling showed this thing and then they compared their sampling against the network. He, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because it comes from like forensic genetics and the Institute of Archaeological <laughs> Research in Cambridge. So it's <laughs> it's an interesting like, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's a... And then, and then let's see, we can dive back. Yeah, we still have, we have time to dive into this. I'm looking at all the ones that we've suggested in the past. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Just go for our back catalog. See. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back catalog. Um, I have this one, convergent. This is a preprint uh, about convergent antibodies. Okay. Looking at uh, how antibodies, I guess, end up being the same type of antibodies. Convergent antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection in convalescent individuals. Uh, let's pop it open and see what figures look like this one's looking like oh it's like eliza's <laughs> lots of eliza's uh <clears throat> oh but they do do neutral they do do a neutralization assay okay uh with the serum Ooh, and they also do uh low resolution structures using electron microscopy 
Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Oh yeah, I see that. Yeah. Maybe. Oh. So I mean. Yeah, two D class averages, three D reconstructed, SARS CoV trimers. Oh, I see. They're just to see that where the because antibodies are big, so they can kind of get a sense of where the antibody might be lying on the structure. Yeah. By just doing a rough. Yeah. <laughs> Just being looking at like where it's binding and whether there's like any so again it's I mean, yeah <laughs> where is the giant antibody lump coming off of in these complexes yeah I mean it's so I mean because I mean it almost got, gets to the epitope mapping discussed in previous papers where they like antibodies looking for yeah. what spot what part of the virus is is vulnerable to to the antibody absolutely and I think the reason why I chose this one is because it is actually looking at convalescent individuals right yeah. we're looking at the serum of humans on on these things people who have recovered yeah right that's and that's like a real big thing because we don't know what we're making when we're going down the antibody path we're hoping we're making good antibodies but the more we know about those antibodies the better <clears throat> It also informs diagnostics because knowing the right antibody could be the right diagnostic test to do. Right? We know what specific, um, yeah, section of the receptor or whatever protein we need to look at. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's. I mean, I had a few retractions. I was, but because last time I did go off on one on the fractions, I was thinking maybe I'll talk about them. In, in, but yeah, I mean, the, I mean, just the, sorry. Shoot. Go, go, go. Throw it out oh, there. Oh, no, I mean, like, wanna... okay, right. So I'll, I guess I'll talk about one of them. No, I'll, I'll limit myself because the, the one I was going to, I mean, there's, there's one I can talk about, which is just a very simple one that was, uh, they, they made a, a very simple kind of error. They, they, so they made a couple of like very, uh, so they're looking at, so this one was, uh, which one was this one? Um, so this one is published in P PNAS and is looking at mm -hmm. like, Identifying airborne transmission as dominant route. So this is a paper that would again it follows mm. what I'd expect. It, it looks at like broad statistics, it, like kind of infection statistics in different areas. So com compares New York to the rest of the U.S. But if you look at the graph, you'll notice that there it, it looks like a bumpy graph. That there there are like what they report like so on like uh, let me ch check up which date. So they they so they on like uh, figure three they've got like they show their data of like the cases that they reported and they basically got the daily mortality case the daily like reported cases which is why there are these massive dips when the weekend go happens because this doesn't measure the actual num time when cases happen it t measures the time when cases are reported but they treat it as if mm. it's when the cases so that causes a problem sure. when analyzing the data and so there's sure so it's been like I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, again, these are these observational studies, right? Like they're not, <laughs> they're not conducting a, a, a controlled experiment. They're trying to infer something from data that they're getting in. And it's a very difficult job to do. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that, cause, cause I'm obsessive and I've been checking the daily, like kind of mortality. I, I immediately spotted, oh wait, those dips are because they're not actually looking at the real data. They look, they just mm. called up, took off some statistics on the website without realizing where it came from and how it was analyzed which is something that everybody should be aware of when you're trying to operate with someone else's data so it's kind of a great right. tale there and there's been, there's like a letter going around where people are going oh retract this blah 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 and uh and uh, but i'll also speak the fact that it was published speaks to that people really want to know this information yeah exactly that's sort of like we should talk about that hamster model because yeah <laughs> <laughs> because that that's an experimental version of this right and like if there is hypotheses that people have about transmission, we could test them there, and then we could try to, <laughs> with again the full limitations of that transmission is not necessarily our transmission as well. I mean, I think you so. make a good point because we haven't actually delved into the transmission side of things yet. I think that's mm -hmm. that's kind of an mm -hmm. interesting thing. Plus, I need to know whether be, I can barbecue again, <laughs> and that that hamster model will, will, will <laughs> tell us. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I was gonna say that. The what, what I have seen about um, like the reopening and everything is that like it's about assessing risk, right? Yeah. And out, outdoor activities, I think people are are saying they're not so bad. Um, yeah, it's that it's those indoor activities unknown, <laughs> and also outdoors, like mm, how you come into contact with people, yeah. really I mean, is going to impact <laughs> things. I mean, joking aside, I feel like this, um, I really like this. I mean, this feels like really in my wheelhouse because I did like during what well, I did like develop a model of transmission for in mice for 
the best you can see. So I'm like very much like. <laughs> oh yeah. I guess Hi uh, highly leaning towards that one. That's <clears throat> that's one of the ones I'm leaning towards. I mean. Okay. That and the. Uh. Well, that and yeah, the one where one? they mutate the mice to well, mutate the virus to be more infectious to mice, which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mouse, the mouse model one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Well, uh, let, let me see what else we have. Oh. There's also the cryo EM structure of the spike protein. This is Ooh. fairly old now, right? But this is right. This is uh, it came out very early, and when we when we did the DNA vaccine paper, um, they 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 referenced this paper because that's the how they knew to use a specific sequence. They wanted to use the one that they knew the structure for. Yeah, I mean, this one I can think they got scooped <clears> on this because they were they were doing similar studies, right? I mean, they were. Do... Mm -hmm. But yeah. Wait, what do you mean doing similar? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So this is cryo. This is like um. It's a very. Uh, looks like a very classic. Uh, structural biology paper. And they do some binding. I think. Do they do binding? Yeah. They do some antigenicity tests across the structure. Uh, okay. Uh, they don't. They don't have the photos. You know. It's nice. Like. I like that when we looked at the or that that one I just pulled up the one where they look at convalescent serum. They actually have some of the <laughs> test photos yeah. from that that help determine the structure. I feel like that just illustrates well to people like how that method works. Yeah. You know, yeah. When you see the two D things and you get a sense that they're being reconstructed in something three D. Anyways, this is like kind of technical. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is probably, It's been cited like one thousand and thirty two times. Uh, according to it's like right. yeah, it's inc it's incredibly popular yeah. paper. I think. I think it's yeah, yeah it's the <clears throat> reference that everyone is using for uh, for that. So. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. So mm -hmm. It, yeah. Um. Uh oh, there's the inactivated vaccine for oh, SARS-CoV-2. Yes. That's the so there's the other <coughs> vaccine. We haven't really talked too much about that, but and that's the yeah. Not, there's an inactivated vaccine that's being moved into humans. So that's. Yep. I think this is the one. Where it's done in, yeah, where they make it in the mice. Published May 6, 2020, in Science. Yes. Oh, so yeah. And I mean, this is we, we've talked a, we've talked about a few vaccines. I mean, we're considering talking about the Moderna one as well. Um, and again, this is the what I consider the classic way of making vaccines: inactivated viral particles. Yeah, this is like the the classic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. And then we can talk about, like, kind of why people aren't so, like, kind of happy about the idea of using the whole, like, vaccine. And, like, the, mm -hmm. there are def definitely some issues with that because, I mean, like, like immune issues or, like, uh, secondary diseases or even this thing that happens with, with some coronaviruses where, it, like, the immune response actually is the virus mani manipulates it so that it, the immune response isn't very good against it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, de depending on what that vaccine is. I, this, these might be formalin treated. What does it say? Uh, it says they're... Um, no, purified, inactivated. I don't know what that means. I mean, <laughs> no, but inact I think inactivated um, refers to usually some sort of fixation, right? Like, I don't think that these uh, yeah. viruses repli replicate at all. They're just, they're just the bags of proteins and stuff. Yeah, uh, so... I mean, <clears throat> see, how does it... But I mean, again, but again, it's like this is a discussion of all these different vaccine types. We've talked about a few vaccines. It's just another vaccine to add to the pile. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, so it looks like they just presaged it until it was like not infectious or, or oh, yeah, no, I need to. But no, that, there's, there's some yeah. stuff we can dig into there. Yeah, 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 there's stuff to dig into for sure. Yeah. Let's see what else is here. Oh, we have like um. No, that, I mean that's. Uh, sorry, I saw a preprint about uh, the mRNA, but in a different protein. I think that's because we couldn't find anything with Moderna, so I had some other things <laughs> like using that platform. But now that data is out. Yeah. So yeah, Moderna, um, come on, give us your data. Yeah, exactly. Huh? What's this? This is uh, this is an interesting one. Seasonality and immunity to laboratory confirmed seasonal coronavirus. Oh, so this is like not our. This is not. The novel coronavirus. This is uh, seasonal coronavirus. Yeah. So, like the common cold coronavirus, seasonal. The, yeah, the common cold coronavirus. Let me send. I actually have a link to that one. Um, 
Yeah, seasonal outrage at all. What sort of data is going to be in this paper if we talk about it? Yeah, we, so we talked about MERS, and then I didn't realize how different MERS was. <laughs> I think this is like one of those things where it's like, you may not realize how different. Oh, this, the figures are very light here. Um, PCR rates, some tables, <laughs> some timelines. They're actually test. It seems like on the back of flu surveillance, they happen to have those samples, and then they do coronavirus surveillance on the same samples. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it looks kind of clinical. I'm not sure if this is as interesting as maybe I was originally thinking about. I think at the beginning, too, I, I wanted to read things that weren't, like, that might be tangentially related to coronavirus, but not necessarily coronavirus itself. I mean... And also, remember when, when, now when we started this, we didn't have much data to go off of, so we were desperate to find, like, yes. papers. Yes, so I, yes. So I don't think we should beat ourselves up. I mean, of course, coronaviruses themselves are quite interesting. Uh, I mean, even before this, they're quite... The, I, I mean, they're, they're quite interesting things to look into. Um, yeah, but I, I actually think that... I, I bet that there are... Like, this one was published uh, at the end of... April, but I bet like if I went into the old literature, we would find more interesting things as well. Because like maybe I was looking for something recent. Like why did I find something 2020 about seasonal coronavirus? Right? Like this could be a paper that was, you know, being done on the back of work that's already been but popular because um, there was the outbreak at that time, just not everywhere, not as widespread. Yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah, there's this bioarchive paper that was very controversial. I don't know if we should talk about it. The it. spike mutation pipeline reveals emergence of the more transmissible form. It's not a good title oh, because right. I, think I... I know that I know that the title is like a an overstatement. They use it's 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 a. I, I feel like I've heard about this paper so many times. I've just never looked at it myself. But it is a bioinformatics paper that is trying to say something about how the changing genome <laughs> somehow um, might make it more transmissible. But it, 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 they can't know that yeah. because, again, they're just – it's observational yeah, data. Yeah, so they basically look at, look at like, yeah, it's – yeah, I, I can see what, 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 where the controversy might be here is because they, since they, they can't make that assumption that it's more transmissible because they just – because it could just be like, yeah <laughs> – it's in those areas. There, there's so many reasons why it could be spreading in those areas, right? And yeah. it could be, I think, founder effect is one of the yeah. things people say, right? It's just that it got there first. Yeah. <laughs> Not that, like, it's the one that most frequently can move around. Yeah. Um, and if we've got good <clears throat> lockdowns in certain countries, you ex should expect to see founder effects like that, where, like... Uh, if, for sure. So, I mean, if only one person escaped and then spread that to an entire country, then we should expect to see that kind of founder effect. So, I don't... Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Uh, I mean, this was on the list because I think that it's a highly discussed paper. Yeah. I don't know how you feel about discussing, right? Because, But it's already been discussed quite a bit, yeah. right? And I feel like I, that I've heard the takedowns in, in what we just said, like in the same line, so I'm not sure what we would add necessarily to the conversation. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, usually, <clears> like, for these sorts of things, I would like to add my own, like, perspective on, on this, but I feel like with this one, I would be going, like, yeah, that sounds... Right. <laughs> that what other people said, that... So, uh... <laughs> yeah, what, the, what they said. <laughs> but, I mean, then again, that's just me being, like, in my comfort zone. I might just... <laughs> because I'm, I'm... No, I think... Yeah. I think it's good to remember. I mean, I'm also like, it's nice to talk about some of them and get a metric on how we're feeling about them so we can maybe move them off or think like maybe we will talk about them later. Oh, right. I mean, uh, uh, I, I do feel like uh, I'm... You're feeling cooler on that yeah, one. I feel like, cool. Yeah, on the temperature, I'm feeling like cool. I feel like I there's not much I, I can really say about it. Um... Yep. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, let's see. We're last five minutes, so maybe we should make a choice. I think we got through some of the old back. I mean, there's still tons of other backlog ones that we could talk about, but I removed some of them from the list, the selection list, and it's good to get a sense of just how we're thinking about some of that older stuff that we might have popped out. Oh, like, what? Well, well, like, oh no, we'll talk about it later. Um, but it sounds like we're looking, we're thinking about a model again, yeah. <laughs> either trans transmission or the mouse one.
<coughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm feeling I'm really feeling that transmission is something we haven't really looked into as much, and it is something that yep. that we really could for sure uh, take a look at. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just hamsters. I, I I've never really thought about the hamsters as well. It'd be fun to read a bit about the other things hamsters are used for. The golden hamster model is used for. Um, I remember how transmission is done. I know people do like flu transmission in ferrets and mice, yeah. actually. There's like these funny setups that they do to do transmission experiments. Yeah, I, I know fer ferrets <laughs> are a lot better to, than, than mice. I remember like, cause we, in like Imperial, we had like this entire like ferret lab and a place I'm not gonna disclose mm. because apparently I'm not allowed to spill, but it's- Yeah, those are secrets. Like you, you don't want the people- obliged to play with the ferrets for two hours. It's, that's the one thing oh, I remember about that. Like, nice. It, <laughs> uh, um, so that's why I wanted to go into flu research when I was in undergrad, because I wanted to play with ferrets, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, let, let's do it. I, I mean, I have no I have no qualms about checking out that. I am very interested in, in transmission models. Um, so yeah, so that's pathogenesis, pathogenesis and transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in golden hamsters. Yes. Published in Nature, May 14th. Yeah, I think that's a yeah. The, looking at hamsters, hamsters are, are, are adorable but bitey. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, they're that's a good one. Yeah, so we're going to look in transmission models in golden hamsters. I think that's because I think that's one of the few like transmission models out there for for SARS-CoV. I don't think I certainly haven't heard of anything else. And we can also tie in some of the papers about. I see we have like a I have a letter from New England Journal of Medicine about aerosol and surface stability of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Like we can we can try to tie in also a little bit. I mean, I, certainly I will tie try to tie in through reading like just some of the stuff that people have been saying about transmission, right? Yeah. And whether or not the model could be used to help with that or not, right? Because like there's like the, there's a whole set of people who do observational research or maybe small sample size research about can they find virus on these surfaces? Does that mean it's transmitting? Yeah. Right? Then then we can try to talk about the interplay. Like what does a model bring to the table that those studies don't? Yeah. Right? And we're trying to understand like a whole thing. There are like so many interesting questions on like fomites and like if i buy something in the supermarket how long should i disinfect it how long should i leave it out for how long do viruses live on surfaces can i get yeah can i yeah, yeah. exactly and then so like we were talking about models but can models tell us right the answers to those questions yeah. or is those are those also a separate realm of information because like um i think that those those are interesting to think about because you know like there is an inherent hype, right, to talk about a new model. <laughs> I'd just be like, what new things will be discovered on the back of this? Um, yeah, and I want to, I want to know more. I want to make my own decisions. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm gonna put that into our list. Move that from here to there. Yeah. So, uh, I think yeah, we found a selection. So I think we can like thank the thank the viewers for listening to us and watching us talk about all these amazing papers and all this amazing research that's happening uh mm -hmm. yeah and again if uh if people are interested in uh sending us papers that they want to discuss right yep. you should tweet us yeah tweet us uh, the hashtags below yep yep mm -hmm. the hashtag uh, is in the corner at hashtag macro twjc and we've got our own twitter accounts underneath and we've also got an uh, an official Twitter account, which is at microtwjc. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and then we can have, and also we've got a Zotero. I put a link in the description that for the microbiology Zotero. Yes. So if you see a paper in our in our archive that you really want us to discuss, then feel free to talk to us about that, and we'll add yeah. it, we'll prioritize that up our list. Absolutely. Yeah. So like like today when I was going when I was saying like oh I'm going through some of the back stuff, I just like. I have this folder open called selection that I try to add our selections to. Then we talk through them during this week, but we don't always, we select one and then I move it into a different folder, but this folder called selection has gotten large. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And so um, that's a good place to look for things that we've already maybe thought about discussing and maybe we just need a nudge to go down that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, hopefully we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll be back next week talking about hamsters, transmission, and fomites and will we be able to escape from our living rooms <laughs> absolutely all right well bye see you all next week see you all next week